my presentation today is going to be something that um, I think will be a little bit familiar to you, but still a bit foreign, I hope, in the sense of talking about some issues that have plagued me for a number of years. There's nothing really new in this paper, nothing many of you haven't heard or at least thought about many times if you've been an archaeologist for very long. More than 40 years after I started my career, is it really that long? Um, I'm still frustrated by it. And what I will talk about can actually be simply put. Archaeology is just not very important to most people. It's a truly insignificant part of their lives. I see lots of heads going like this, and I think that you probably recognize what I'm saying, even though it's important to us. To say that it is insignificant, though, does not mean that they see it as dull. They are actually, in many cases, very interested in it. They may actually be so interested that they might say to you, and I'm sure many of you who are archaeologists have heard this, I always wanted to be an archaeologist when I was a child. But of course, it somehow is not important enough to do as an adult. And those of you who are younger, who have parents, when you told them you were going into archaeology, they said, can you get a job? <laughs> so you know that kind of feeling about the things I'll be talking about. But in particular, what I'm going to be talking about is the notion of contemporary archaeology or archaeology of the contemporary, to be more precise, and how it plays into some of the kinds of answers that I think I'm going to try to give you to this kind of question about what the problem is in all of this. Um, it's in many ways uh, some musings of sorts about why and what we should do about the problem of people's interest in archaeology. Part of the reason for this is that no matter what we archaeologists think archaeology is, the public still thinks of archaeology in a sense as antiquarianism. And antiquarianism, as you can see defined on the screen, is favoring the curious details about the historical or scientifically important things. And then, uh, in that sense, the public is an antiquarian. And we have made them so. And I'll try to get to why in a moment. Uh, they favor the exotic, esoteric, romantic aspects of the discipline. They care um, very little for the academic side. They prefer the Indiana Jones of the left, stealing treasure. Unfortunately, many of our colleagues feel the same way. We'll get more to that in a moment, too. Um, they don't prefer this. You might recall Joe Watkins' slide of the blackboard filled with formulas and the like. And you may even remember in the film, at least one of them, Indiana Jones climbing out the window to get away from it. You remember that one? It's just sort of that view of archaeology that we have. So um, there may be a few people, a few ways, a few folks that are very aware that archaeology is one way to study and learn about their heritage. But for most, especially non-indigenous people, heritage feels distant and connections to their daily lives seem vague. Stereotypic images of what archaeologists study and how they do do it tend to confuse the public about what archaeology might contribute to contemporary life. As archaeologists, to get the public's attention, we emphasize the exciting. And here are some of the selected headlines. Some of them are a little bit vague behind the, the square that's there, the rectangle that's there. But you can read them, I think. Um, look at the red ones especially. The earliest, the first, and then the exotic kinds of things, the first, the first dental work. And this is just some headlines from Archaeology Magazine's website. And I think you've seen this often in your careers if you're an archaeologist. And sometimes, in fact, you may well have done that. I know I did in the early 70s when I was working on the Crow Peak Massacre site, the largest prehistoric known massacre in North America. And it got attention, certainly. So what has happened is that we emphasize all of this over everything else. And what happens is that the scientific things we do get lost. Um, 
archaeology and its job is usually very mundane, as most of you know. But what's happened to us is that we've created the brand, as Cornelius Holdorf talked about it in his book. We created a brand, and one of the brands that you can see there is archaeologist is hero. I know I'm heroic, aren't you? So I think that you understand the uh, things that we try to do or seem to do, and of course, that's the thing we liked about Indiana Jones. He was somehow heroic as an archaeologist. Uh, also, I might say male. <laughs> but at any rate, one of the things that you can see in the lower quote is that um, I always said at and I'd like to be an archaeologist. All my life I have dreamed of discovering something. And that's what showed up in the Operation uh, Nightingale quotation that you had. People want to discover things. And that's the important part that keeps people going in archaeology. So you can understand that brand and how it operates. This is an example from my own work. I was involved in the Children's Museum of Indianapolis. It's the largest children's museum in the world, believe it or not. And it's a place that gets a lot of money from National Geographic and other sources. And one of the things that they decided to do was to put together an exhi um, ex exhibition on archaeology. It has a lot of science in it, a lot of fun in it. And they titled it, very unfortunately, and my colleague Paul Mullins and I, who were consultants to this, tried and tried and tried to get them to change it, but they titled it Treasures of the Earth. And that word treasure, I think, probably is one that irritates most of us who are archaeologists. So the kids, when they go, will see the archaeology. They have Captain, they have the discovery of Captain Kidd's uh, ship there. And they have a nice pile of fake cannons. And the kids are allowed to run across them and play and everything else that you can imagine. They pay attention to the science a bit, but the rest of it, is much more attractive to them with the hands-on kind of activities. And I know that Carol's probably going to talk about that a little bit. So what happens, I think, is this. We raise this expectation in archaeology that basically archaeology is somehow fun, but it's boring. And what happens is that I think we create, by our choice of vocabulary, the kinds of things that people want to be exciting want to be fantastic. And consequently, we have a whole industry of pseudo-archaeology that's developed as a kind of ancillary um, field, if you want to think of it in those terms, to main mainstream archaeology. And most of you are familiar with a lot of these kinds of people in advance, Graham Hancock and so forth, and Eric Von Donniken, certainly. And one of my favorites, actually a personal friend uh, um, who does a series called America Unearthed. I probably, you probably have not seen it here in the UK or elsewhere, but it is the most wild ass thing you ever saw in your life. <laughs> uh, Scott and I have had conversations about that, and he says, I'm making money, you're just jealous. <laughs> okay, he's, he's right, but not, not, not because of that. Uh, but again, the brand may be very different from the reality of what we do. This is a Calvin and Hobbes cartoon. I'm not sure how many of you know this cartoon strip, but uh, they've had a, a whole section over the years on archaeology. And if you can't read it in, in the back, it says, archaeology, ar archaeologists dig slowly and carefully using small, delicate tools. Each rock has to be painstakingly brushed and scraped so nothing is broken or missed. Dig, dig, scrape, scrape, scrape. Archaeologists have the most mind-numbing job on the planet. And I think the point is well taken. Most of what we do is pretty darn dull. How many of you have sat in a laboratory writing small numbers on artifacts. You want boredom? There's a good case in point for it. So what I think is something that's really important for us to consider is that archaeology is not really about time. That word archaeo gets in the way of what we really do. I think archaeology, for the most part, is just a detailed study of material culture. It doesn't really matter when it was found. It just matters what it means to us. What our brand does is actually trivializes what we really do. 
And if we can start to get people to think in different ways about archaeology, we can make some headway in the kinds of things that we would like archaeology to be. We would like archaeology to be understood as. And one of the things that I think is very important for us is that we need to try to do something that is much more important for contemporary societies. I, I absolutely love the paper on, on Operation Nightingale. Thank you so much for introducing what I'm going to say here because it really shows a, a complex but good example of the value of archaeology when it's put to the task of trying to understand something that relates to people's day-to-day -day lives. In my own work, I've done a lot of research in recent years on the archaeology of homelessness. It's uh, been fun in many ways. It's been depressing in many ways. It's been utterly enlightening in many ways. And I had the same kind of experience you had with Operation Nightingale because we got people directly involved in things that were related often to their own heritage. They were involved. They realized that they had a heritage, that they had specialized knowledge and skills that the rest of us actually don't have very well. Orientation, being able to do maps. Um, they dig pretty well. Rachel Kitty, in her similar study in York, actually looked at homeless archaeology in the sense of trying to bring people into very active involvement for their self-esteem. And one of the things that Rachel was able to do was actually get two or three people so involved that they became part of a lecturing group. And one of them, an addicted woman, Jane, Jane actually went with Rachel and the team to Cambridge, to the Department of Archaeology, and lectured. Were any of you there at that? Some of you from that area, but from this area of the world. Um, and apparently, from what Rachel says, did a magnificent job. So what we need to do is to try to get people engaged in, in contemporary archaeology. But it has to relate somehow to their lives, something they can be involved in that means something to them, and it helps to raise their self-esteem. Now, we're talking about specialized groups there. But the thing that happens is that when you start talking about this publicly, there are a number of people, in fact, a lot of people internationally, who really get attracted to archaeology because of what's been done. Um, for example, when some of the first press releases came out of my university about the project in um, Indianapolis, there were art articles, inquiries, and other things from four or five different countries. There are small projects in Nigeria now, in Santiago, Chile now, uh, and several more in the US, starting undergraduates are starting to get involved in looking at this question. Something triggered that. And often it was this sort of notion that the public is um, interested but not engaged directly with the kinds of big things, the big discoveries that we make. Yeah, they're interested, but it doesn't mean much more to them than perhaps in some cases just entertainment. Now, that said, normal citizens get really excited with all of this. When I first started the project in St. Paul, Minnesota, I was digging on an historic mansion site. And one of the things that happened was I gave a talk to the general public about the historic mansion site. And at the very end, threw in two or three slides about the homeless people who lived on the site. I asked for questions at the end. And one of the things that happened was that every single question was about the homeless research. People coming up to me at the end and saying, oh, I know of this homeless site. You got to come look at it. But what the heck is going on there? It's because somehow they are engaged with the things that are really the most important to them in their lives. Something they can identify with both materially and uh, uh, emotionally. They know, to a degree, what the materials are that they're looking at, but they can learn some very exotic things about them as well. So the public interest has been intense and international. Archaeologists themselves are taking archaeology more seriously. We have a journal of contemporary archaeology now. Um, we are even producing spoofs about it. Have any of you seen this yet? Just won a big award at the uh, uh, Archaeology Channel's 
um, International Archaeology Film Festival. It's a short one, very much fun, but one of the things I want you to notice in all of this is that because we are um, interested in it, you please look at the man's name and the title he's given. Of course, it's a spoof name, but so is the title, but there's some importance here in all of this, I think. So while interested, many in the public remain skeptical. Is it really archaeology? And my response to that would be, would, would be, why does it matter? As long as we're getting people engaged in the kinds of things that we do and use as tools, the kinds of things that we study as material culture, no matter the age. But we also have some professional co colleagues who are very skeptical as well. Uh, so for example, um, you know, even the archaeologists have said this for a long time, there may be some things that have different meanings to some of the archaeologists involved. Uh, for example, one of my colleagues said to me, you don't do archaeology anymore, you do politics. Which flabbergasted me, but it gave me some understanding about some of the divides between traditional sorts of archaeology and the kinds of things that a lot of contemporary archaeologists or archaeologists of the contemporary are doing. Uh, a few years ago now, um, Jeremy Savloff of, of uh, many places, then uh, just retired from this being the president of the SAA and doing some other kinds of things, wrote a book called Archaeology Matters, and you read the book and you realize we archaeologists have been saying that archaeology matters for a long, long time, but we define it in many ways that are so different. One of the things that I'm going to suggest is that to, to make it significant, we need to make it activist in ways that have a lot of meaning to people besides just entertainment and sort of generalized uh, uh, knowledge of heritage. Many of you remember the Garbage Archaeology Project. You remember the book Rubbish, perhaps? Some people still teach the book. I still have taught it on occasion in my intro classes. But one of the things that you might recognize if you've thought about this, when is the last time you actually heard the phrase garbage archaeology? But have any of you heard the phrase garbology? It's been in almost every news story that has come out in recent years about the Garbage Archaeology Project. It's a project that's still going. There are different aspects of it that are being studied by some of the graduate students at the University of Arizona and other places. And one of the things that um, it's never referred to as now is archaeology. So what I'm going to suggest for us is that we try to make a transition toward what archaeology is really about. Not just the old stuff, not just the fantastic discoveries and the like. And maybe it's time for some kind of name change. And we have, if we have some things that are going on, perhaps think of a different ology. Not just archaeology, because that has such a, a brand behind it that's causing us grief. Remember this guy's name again? A contemporologist? Perhaps we're things like that, and that's important. So, however we make it happen, archaeology needs, as uh, Victor Buckley said, uh, needs to earn its keep. Thank you.